We're on the clock now where we give our panelists about 15 seconds each to sound off on the following topics. First up, recently released 911 tapes detail calls were made after a man collapsed in the cafeteria of Albuquerque's VA 500 yards from the emergency room. You might have seen this. The caller says the hospital's rapid response won't take action as the man is out of the, man, the main medical building and expresses frustration at a table of doctors nearby who were just sitting there. Nurses and others, however, did perform CPR and use an emergency defibrillator on the man who later died. Now, Russell, although the hospital followed protocol, the VA spokesperson says that it, the rapid response policy is under review. It just came out badly, didn't it? Just the whole thing as it was reported just sounded awful. So, it, yeah, and know. it comes at a time where the VA nationally is, is facing a lot of heat for its waiting list and right. a number of deaths and treatment delays. I think it just fits in the narrative. You know, it, it does yeah. hospital policies. I talk to experts and say, no, this is a policy. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you never know. They could have rushed him. Uh, there could have been a number of factors that happened if they did try to, to walk him over there. Mm -hmm. So they follow policy. But yet, right now, in mm -hmm. this climate, mm -hmm. Is, it's, it's, a, it's, a it's a difficulty. Laura, you know, what can one do in these kind of, a situa these kind of situations? It's awfully difficult. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly one whose uh, family member is in that situation, right. you, you hope that they would do everything possible to try to save them. Right. And I think part of the problem is there was a lot of confusion initially about right. what kind of care he received. Um, we didn't find out till later that there were actually attempts to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to save him through CPR. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot that they could still review and change as far as the policies mm -hmm. go. I'm glad you said that because it did sound, Rob, like he just dropped dead on the spot and nobody was even looking at him. There was an attempt uh, at some sort. Yeah, some I sort, suspect you know. from reading this story that there was a fear of lawsuits. Uh, That's what I think was driving this oh, policy. Right. Just an educated guess. Yeah, I hear, you. I hear you though. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Gary, what do you think on this one? Um, I think it, there's just a big systemic failure uh, here, and I think you're probably right that there was a uh, fear of lawsuits. But if you imagine a group of doctors on the street and somebody drops uh, from a heart attack, they, of course, would rush right away. That's so right. why is there a difference when it's a VA hospital? That's a good question. Ranchers and environmentalists are on opposite sides of the fence in a battle over protecting the meadow jumping mouse. Recently listed as endangered, ranchers object to a U.S. Forest Service proposal to put up a fence that would keep cattle out of a meadow where the mouse lives. And environmentalists started the process to sue the Forest Service for greater protections for the critter they say is crucial to the ecosystem. Rob, you wrote about this in The Watchdog. Tell us more. What's actually happening here? What's well, the nature the, of the fight? Well, the nature of the fight is the mouse. Yeah. Is, uh, mm -hmm. Because the meadow jumping mouse was, uh, was listed as endangered just a little bit over a month ago. Mm -hmm. And there's not just this battle that's going on mm -hmm. in around the Los Alamos area, but also down in Otero County. And the Forest Service is mm -hmm. catching hell from both sides. The environmentalists mm -hmm. say they're not doing enough. The ranchers say they're doing too much. Classic case of the Forest Service, that, like Rob's caught in the middle. Right. It's amazing how this goes, yeah. Well, and it's always amazing to see the rhetoric being about the mouse or the celery meadow, uh, meadow or whatever the case may be, but mm -hmm. it's about the whole ecosystem as a whole, and it really does put the Forest Service in a bad spot. Exactly. Russell? We also have the lesser prairie chicken out in southeastern mm -hmm. New Mexico. It's, been another, it's another clash mm -hmm. between environmentalists and uh, ranchers. And, and I got a feeling where you've come down on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am from Deming. Green. I'm from Deming, and I also took ag mechanics in high school. I'm from an agricultural community. I've picked chili. Yep. I understand the agricultural side of it. I'm not just a crazy green you know, tree hugger. Um, but I will say this. I think this is a classic, you know, one of those classic issues where government has to take much more proactive steps to get more mm -hmm. stakeholders involved. Mm -hmm. I think responsible planning requires stakeholders and a, a long process where there are people who have um, a say in, the, in what's going on. I don't think that's happened at this point. Mm, there you go. In 2011, seven female plaintiffs working for Bernalillo County filed a lawsuit claiming that male supervisors retaliated against them when they spoke out about sexual harassment and getting passed over for promotions. Now, last month, about 230 more women joined the class action gender discrimination suit. And Laura, a Bernalillo County spokesperson, said there was no evidence to support such a case. But, but 230 speaks volumes. What, what did you, when you first heard that number, what was your gut reaction that 230 are joining? Um, major systemic problems, mm -hmm. um, serious overhaul of policies. Um, and it and mm -hmm. made me, you know, the... Uh, Stereotypical good old boys club is what it made, made me think mm -hmm, of. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's really a terrible image for Bernalillo County mm -hmm. and one that they need to ad seriously address. 230 is much worse than seven. I mean, it, it just kind of yeah, goes that way. Two yeah. Thirds, yeah, pretty much more bigger than seven. So. Sure. But I think this is also going to come right around the time where we have the new, um, the New Mexico Law Enforcement Academy meeting about the increasing number of female deputies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is, we're about to have a larger discussion about, about right. uh, female representation in government. Right. What did you make of it? County says that there's nothing 
to this lawsuit, so naturally the 230 uh, women say that there is. Uh, I say this thing was filed back in 2011, it's 2014, let's get Let's get going on mm -hmm. this thing. It's bad, for, it's bad for business, though, isn't it? It really it's is bad for business, yeah. but what's interesting is that mm -hmm. this is not surprising at all. What's surprising is that there's the data out there, and right. you've got the plaintiffs that are willing to come forward. We've known for years that interviewing tends not to be terribly valid, that there's all sorts of mm -hmm. hidden biases in the evaluation uh, process. So it's actually surprising that this doesn't happen more often. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission this week issued a cease and desist order against former New Mexico Governor Tony Anaya, citing violations of securities laws by failing to disclose that two so-called consultants in his company, Natural Blue, were actually lawbreakers secretly running the business. Mr. Anaya agreed to a settlement with the SEC and is barred from participating in any offerings of penny stocks for five years. Harry, although Mr. Anaya may face financial penalties later, he cooperated fully in all that kind of right. thing. What's, what's crushing here was just the idea that we, you know, a former governor could be like a shell face figure right, for these right. two people. Mm -hmm. It really kind of hurts, actually, in a way, if you've been around a lot. I, I mean, I was a fan. Right. I, I think mm -hmm. he's a very interesting man, and how right. this happens is very difficult to watch. Well, it, it, it's just reprehensible because the baseline ethical duty that any company and its management owes its investors is honest information. And the fact that, in some sense, he would trade on his position mm -hmm. in order to deceive investors is unconscionable. And mm -hmm. the fact that he cooperated, I think, is a good thing. The SEC doesn't have a lot of resources right. to be able to prosecute these things, but it, it, it's just completely reprehensible. You know, it's out of the SEC Boston office, and one of the one of the people are now in Bulgaria or something. <laughs> you know, I saw that. So, oh, the intrigue, right. the international intrigue here. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and Governor Anaya is a former attorney general. That's so right he That's does right. and should know the law. Good point. One of the things that popped into my head reading this story was, um, I wonder if it's time to change the name of the Tony Anaya building on 2550 Cerritos Road in Santa Fe. That's right. Wouldn't be the only building in town to right. have that question asked. Your thoughts? And it just fits in the narrative that you know for our former elected officials always get into some sort of trouble, mm -hmm. whether, whether they're we're leaving in the cloud or they face some sort of indictments or right. something. It just fits in that. And it's because we're in poor states. We have a lot of things to do. That's right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, um, Governor and I was on the board of the Green Chamber um, mm -hmm. up until uh, a few months before I left the Green Chamber. Um, I worked with them. I found him to be really helpful and mm -hmm. knowledgeable. Um, I think one of the things I at least I see in this is that, you know, compared to the penalties that the other CEO, the one that was his successor, received, mm -hmm. his seemed um, less so because the other guy had to pay a hundred fifty thousand fine, mm -hmm. and he was banned for life right. from mm -hmm. um, participating in any penny offerings, right. um, or being an officer, or being an officer, That's right, right Which for is a big life. Deal. Sure. So uh, his penalties seemed a little bit more to me. It sounds like the deal was struck with Governor mm -hmm. Anaya. Right. Um, he was, uh, you know, cooperated and gave a lot of information to the SEC. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he got a reduced penalty. I still right. think it's a black mark, but I do sure. hope mm -hmm. that he can, you know, redeem himself from all of it. There you go. Thank you all for being here. Now we have a special on the clock on the web. Be sure to find us. Join us next week when we look at whether or not New Mexico should shift to an open primary system. And as always, all of us here at New Mexico in Focus appreciate your time and your effort to stay informed and engaged. Catch up with us anytime on social media by searching New Mexico in Focus. And you can find archived interviews and often bonus material from our shows on our YouTube channel and at NewMexicoInFocus.org. I'm Gene Grant. We'll see you next week in focus.